Welcome to yet another uh, Planetary Society weekly hangout. I am Casey Dreyer, the advocacy and outreach strategist for the Planetary Society, bringing you another week to talk about the latest news in space exploration, planetary exploration, science, and all the other cool stuff that we do here at the Planetary Society. Uh, my guest today will be uh, Emily Lakdawalla, the senior editor for the Planetary Society. She just returned from Houston uh, covering the Lunar and uh, Planetary Sciences Conference, a yearly conference which is the biggest uh, scientific gathering of minds for the uh, planetary science world. Latest updates on curiosity, on opportunity, on mercury meteorites maybe, and all other sorts of really interesting stuff. So we will be covering this. Uh, Emily will talk about her, her kind of latest news out of that conference and also I will be giving a quick budget update. We have some legitimately uh, great news uh, coming out of the, the world of politics which is just a weird thing to say. Uh, before I go any further I want to remind you that you're watching a production of the Planetary Society. The Planetary Society is a nonprofit organization entirely funded by its members. We educate, we create projects, we create research opportunities and we also work in the world of politics to make sure that the scientific missions that we love and the things that just inspire us so much continue to happen. And so I ask you if you like what you see here, if you like our website, Emily's great blog, and our uh, quarterly magazine, The Planetary Report, please consider joining the Planetary Society as a member. Uh, you can really support space, you support space exploration, and you, uh, it's a great way to form as a, a community with us. So planetary.org slash join if you want to join as a member or planetary.org slash donate if you just want to kick us a few bucks as a form of appreciation. So I will remind you all again in the future. And again, before we start, you can ask us questions online on our Google Plus page for this event. You can ask questions on the YouTube uh, page where this is being broadcast right now. And you can go onto Twitter and use hashtag planetary live to ask us any questions, me or Emily. So. Emily, welcome. I need to turn on my microphone. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so let me, uh, before we go, we go into the Lunar Planetary Science Conference, I just want to give a quick update on the budget. And so, because again, I'm, I'm just insanely excited. So for all of you who have been following or haven't been following and all this other stuff, fundamentally what happened last year, the president's budget request, the proposal uh, for the federal budget spending, cut planetary science within NASA by about 20%. That's a pretty big cut for one year, and it would just keep going down the next couple of years. And so this would preclude a mission to Europa. This would really hit outer planets' missions. Small missions would be pushed off years in the future. Mars would limp along. It would just be this devastating cut to the program, even after huge successes like Curiosity and Cassini and Messenger and Mercury. And it was just battered, bad. And so the Planetary Society and other scientific organizations leapt into action about this. We've been doing, you know, face visits in Washington, D.C. We've been organizing tens of thousands. We had over 60,000 people write letters to their Congress people, to the president, to people in the Office of Management and Budget saying, save our science. Let, cur let curiosity continue in the, in the solar system. Fund this great program and we're asking for $1.5 billion a year. This is a very reasonable number. It's a tiny bit of NASA, but $1.5 billion a year, you keep it flat, you can go to Europa. You can go back to Mars and cash a sample. You can really increase the number of small missions, and you can create a really strong research level for scientists to, uh, to, to do their work and to, to build the next generation of, of planetary scientists. So up and down a lot, we've had the sequester, we've had all this political gridlock. There's a tough, tough year, but what happened is the Senate passed a bill uh, a week ago that funds the government for the rest of 2013, so the next six months. There was language in this bill that said, restore $223 million to planetary science. This isn't, doesn't reverse the entire bit of the cut, but it reverses the vast majority of the cut, 70% back. 223 million, that's a lot of money for planetary science. This means that we can move discovery back up. We can do a new small mission next year. We can uh, really bump up spending for the Mars program. We can start formulation activities for a Europa mission. There's a specific line in there to start making a mission to Europa. 
great news. When basically everything else in NASA was cut this year, planetary science was restored by Congress. They heard all of our messages. They heard all the work we were doing. They listened. We had great support in Congress. And we had a victory. I, I am actually, I don't even know what to do by having a victory. Um, excuse me. Uh, we're, this is really fantastic. So it's a, it's a really great situation. We're, we're really excited here at the Planetary Society. If you're a member, uh, you're going to be getting an email with more details from Bill Nye, our CEO. If you are uh, a person who has signed one of our action, action alerts and, and written to Congress, you've already heard from us letting you know this great news. And so, and again, this is just, so 2013 is done. We've fixed 2013. The next six months, we're good. However, and there's always a however, in two weeks, uh, the president will release the budget proposal for 2014 next year. And it's an open question. Will that budget acknowledge that Congress said no last time, put keep planetary science as a priority, or will the budget disregard that and continue the cut and minimalizing, uh, minimizing uh, planetary science at NASA? So even though we've had a great success and we've shown what we can do working together as the Planetary Society and as advocates for space, we will may need to do this again in a, just a few weeks. So it's a, it, this is, again, why the Planetary Society is here. We're following this for you. We're keeping very close eye on this situation. And we're keeping the heat on the president and Congress to make sure that planetary science at NASA gets the funding that it deserves. So I'll, I will be keeping all of you very informed here. April 10th is the key date. That's when the budget comes out. So, But again, we can just celebrate for the next two weeks. If you happen to run into a congressperson uh, like you do, uh, say thank you for funding planetary science. So that's the big, that's the big spiel for planetary science today. And uh, again, just good news. I, I'm, again, still not used to saying uh, good news. <laughs> so I'm, I'm very happy. Anyway, let's move on to, uh, to science, and let's celebrate and, and revel in all of the great uh, findings that politics and funding enables us to go out and do. So, Emily, tell us a little bit about uh, Lunar and Planetary Science Conference called LPSC, where it was, and uh, just first kind of give us an overview of why it's so cool and why you like going there. Sure. Well, uh, the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference is a, actually a pretty old conference. It's been around for decades. Uh, it's run by the Lunar and Planetary Institute, which is based at the Johnson Space Center. Um, and that used to be where LPSC was held. Used to be, and uh, I am actually one of the people who went to the Lunar and Planetary Science Conference while it was still held on the campus of Johnson Space Center. Some tiny little rooms. Everybody packed into one tiny room upstairs to hear the latest results from Galileo. So it's been going on for a long time, but it grows bigger every year. Um, and it's increasing size. This year it had 1,800 scientists, more than 1,800 attending. Um, so it's now held in a suburb of Houston, between Houston and the airport, um, where there is a large conference center, four parallel tracks going on. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a planetary geology conference. So the, the, the four tracks are always kind of interesting. There's always at least one room that's devoted to Mars, much to the chagrin of outer planet scientists. There's um, usually at least one room that where they spend their entire time talking about analyzing meteorites and pre-solar grains and the people in that room speak their own vocabulary that nobody else understands about this, that, and the other isotope and fractionation and alteration and all kinds of stuff and, and only those kinds of people can enter that room. Um, and then the other rooms, there's, there's often one track going on on icy satellites or um, maybe a special one on, on, uh, on other planets. Mercury had um, one session. It's had a session every single LPSC because of Messenger for the last several years. Um, the icy moon sessions have waxed and waned. This year was, uh, I'm afraid to say, a rather slim year for icy moons with only one session on all of the icy moons except Titan, and I think like half a session on, maybe one session on Titan. Um, poor Venus has been waning and waning as the years go on. I think it would be quite educational to plot a chart of the number of talks and posters on Venus over the course of the years, and it's a monotonic decline. I studied Venus when I was in graduate school, and I'm very sad about that. Um, but nonetheless, there's always really great science being presented. This year, there were high hopes for the Curiosity results, because, of course, Curiosity landed on Mars in August. This was going to be the first meeting where uh, there were geologists talking to geologists about the results from Curiosity. 
And in fact, there were um, three uh, full half-day oral sessions devoted to curiosity, plus lots and lots of talks throughout the rest of the week. So my week was very, very Mars heavy. Um, and I learned a lot about the kinds of things that curiosity has found in terms of the mudstones at the, at the John Klein site that they're investigating with their drill. Um, I've learned more about what they're learning from orbit, like somebody suggested that there were paraglacial landforms called pingos in the, uh, in the sort of fan area to the north of where Curiosity is right now. Um, and I learned a lot more about water on Mars in general and what people are thinking about. And I think some of the coolest pictures that I saw came from studies of a site called Marth Vallis that is, was one of the alternative landing sites for Curiosity. It was one of the final four and it wasn't selected, but it does sound and look pretty awesome. And uh, hopefully the Europeans will be sending their ExoMars rover to that site um, if they manage to get it there on their new Russian uh, landing um, uh, gear. Partners. They just recently, yeah, last, last week they announced a, a partnership with the Russians, and the Russians are going to be providing their EDL, their entry, descent, and landing hardware onto Mars. So we'll, we'll wish them the best of luck with that. Um, but yeah, it's a, it's a great meeting. There's four oral sessions. People stand up and give 10-minute talks, and then there's time for questions. And then there's two poster sessions during the week, one on Tuesday and one on Thursday, with just this vast room full of posters. I, I describe it as being like science fair for grown-ups. People write down their, their you know, hypothesis and their methods, and they put on some graphs of data and their conclusions, and they stand there in front of their posters talking about it to whoever will pass by. The only difference between an LPSC poster session and a high school science fair is the presence of beer, which lubricates the discussions and makes the whole thing a, a quite a convivial, convivial atmosphere. So it was a fun meeting. So you said, uh, let's start maybe then with Mars, since you had a lot of Mars uh, talks and there was even a press conference. So was there anything major announced at the press conference? Because uh, there had been a press conference just uh, earlier that week. Right. As a matter of fact, there had been a press conference about Curiosity the week before that, that made this major announcement that um, they have confirmed that the sediments that Curiosity is sitting on formed in, a, in an environment that Earth microbes would consider very benign. It was a neutral pH, um, not the incredibly acid environment that Opportunity has found before, or the incredibly salty, briny, like think... Um, a Great Salt Lake type environment, which is also not particularly habitable. It's not very nice to uh, microorganisms that are that you know, are dependent on water, and, and they're not being salt to suck out of the water out of their insides. The the stuff that Curiosity is sitting on appears to have been laid down in a standing or very slow moving body of water that had very neutral pH. It would have been a very pleasant place if you plunked Earth microbes down there from pretty much any freshwater location on Earth, they probably wouldn't die anyway. I don't know, I don't know if I could uh, promise you that they'd last a long time. They still need to worry about sources of uh, food and things like that, but they even talked about there being chemical gradients. Um, and what they mean by that is that you have, say, an element like sulfur, which can exist both in oxidized and reduced forms, and pretty much all kinds of metabolism, whether it's plant metabolism or animal metabolism, takes an oxidized form of something and turns it into a reduced form of something, or vice versa. And that by, by um, kind of facilitating this chemical transformation, energy is released and they metabolize and they can grow and reproduce and do all the things that life likes to do. So um, the thing that I thought was interesting about, last, about the press briefing that was two weeks ago is that this success, the fact that they found this habitable environment, it's not really Curiosity that deserves the credit for finding this habitable environment. It's the landing site selection committee. It's the people who spent five years poring over data from three different Mars orbiters trying to find the place on Mars that they were most likely to find this kind of environment and study it with a, an instrument package that was designed to study this kind of environment. So. Even though it was Curiosity that confirmed it, ground truth is what Curiosity was sent there to do, I think we should be giving a big pat on the back to John Grant and Matt Gollenbeck and the 150 members of the Mars science community, or however many it was, who, wound up, who selected Gale Crater as the landing site. So I'm going to give them a little round of applause for that. Yeah, and just to point out that that's not an easy thing to do. I mean, uh, 
and nor has that always happened in the past. So Spirit was a notable exception to this. You just want to digress into this for a minute? Sure, yeah. So Spirit was sent to a place that was supposed to be a crater lake. If you look at Gusev Crater from orbit, there's a river channel coming in from the bottom, and there's another one coming out of the top. You know that there was water in Gusev Crater sometime in the past. But when Spirit got there, they landed in what um, the principal, the project scientist, or principal investigator Steve Squires memorably called a basalt prism. So whatever lake sediments might have been there inside Gustav Crater, it had been all covered up by basaltic lava flows, and Spirit had nothing to look at in terms of um, watery environments until after driving all the way across the flat plains and starting to climb the mountains, the Columbia Hills, where it did find some pretty interesting stuff. But it wasn't what they, it wasn't the lake sediments they came there to look for. And similarly, both uh, one of the Vikings and Pathfinder were landed at um, near the mouth of one of these large river valleys that comes from Mars' southern highlands to the northern lowlands in the hopes that they'd find evidence of these kinds of sedimentary rocks too. And, and they didn't. So curiosity being in a place with lake bed sediments and evidence evidence for rivers flowing and tumbled rocks making rounded stones more rounded than anything that's ever been seen anywhere else on mars is is really quite a coup but it's not curiosity's coup it's mars reconnaissance orbiter and mars express and mars odyssey and mars global surveyor whose two decades of work in mars orbit are the ones that that managed to finally identify and narrow down and a lot of it really comes down to CRISM, which is the Compact Reconnaissance Imaging Spectrometer for Mars. Very um, good. Thank you. Uh, which is one of the instruments on Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter that was finally able to identify these tiny patches of clay minerals. Um, and with that and with stratigraphy and things that they've been doing from orbit, they managed to find Gale Crater and a couple of other likely locations where they could also have found these environments on Mars. So speaking of uh, clay minerals, let's uh, transition to opportunity because opportunity is also in has seen some, chrism has seen something kind of where opportunity is, and that's also a, means like it could be it had been a watery location in the past. So what's opportunity seeing on the other side of Mars right now? Yeah, that's right. I liked how so there was an opportunity session that was only half an oral session long. So just the, there were six times as many uh, oral sessions. It's, six times as much oral session time devoted to curiosity as was to opportunity. But the first person who spoke in the opportunity session said, you know, hey, I'd like to point out that we actually have a second rover sitting on Noachian clay materials and exploring them on the surface of Mars. Noachian is like the age. It's like, if you know what Precambrian is for Earth, that's like Noachian on Mars. It's the most ancient era of Mars's geologic history. Um, and that's when these clay minerals seem to have formed and the CRISM, the Compact Reconnaissance Imaging Spectrometer for Mars, detected a tiny amount of this clay stuff on the rim of Endeavour Crater and uh, Opportunity drove 13 kilometers in order to get there. Now, in the time that it took Opportunity to get there, she's an, an aging rover. Um, she's lost a couple of her science instruments. She's only got two of them left. There's the uh, PANCAM and the Alpha Particle X-ray Spectrometer. And unfortunately, neither of these instruments is terribly well suited to identifying whether these things are clay minerals or not. So it's a little bit of a challenge for that mission to figure out <clears throat> if they actually are uh, detecting on the ground the minerals that the CRISM team thinks they're detecting from orbit. But they made a very strong case for it and they're actually at a part of Endeavour Crater that is um, where the signal wasn't really that strong from orbit. So they're wrapping up there now. They have to park the rover and essentially give it a three-week list of commands to do over conjunction while Mars is on the opposite side of the sun from Earth um, because they can't really communicate reliably with the rover. So they give it a very safe set of commands, including taking that alpha particle X-ray spectrometer and, and pointing it on one of these clay, hopefully clay-rich rocks for weeks. And then af after conjunction is over, which is at the end of April, they're going to pick up the anchor and drive south to a part of the Endeavour rim where the clay signal was much stronger. So hopefully the, the word from Opportunity will be getting more and more interesting. But I, I think... think Sorry, I just want to jump in and say that, I mean, what's so cool about I mean, this is like why it's so great to have a rover instead of a lander, right? Because they, they, they landed somewhere else, but then through CRISM they saw that this really interesting kind of rim of Endeavour crater had all of this possible clay mineralogy, and so they just drove down there. <laughs> they just drove down there. It they took them, what, down. seven years, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> well, <laughs> so it, it took them... Slow rovers still, yeah. It took That's them a long time to drive down there, but really it's it, it cannot be emphasized enough how 
um, different the material is that Opportunity is looking at right now from the stuff it's been driving on for the first nine years of its mission. So it's, it's really like landing in a whole new landing site. The stuff that it was on before is the sulfate-rich stuff, very acid environment, very nasty to life. Um, what it's looking at now is um, from the, is more benign, more pH environment. It's got these things that Casey has put up on the screen here, a picture of what they call new berries. Um, and uh, Opportunity has seen concretions all over the place. And th these were hematite-rich concretions. Hematite is an iron oxide material. Um, oh yeah, I need to click on your screen in order to show it to people. So here, so these are new berries. Um, and the thing is that these look an awful lot like the hematite concretions that, that Opportunity has been seeing throughout its mission, but they're not. Um, as far as they can tell, they're made of the same stuff as the rock it's embedded in. There might be a tiny bit of iron enrichment, but it might only be a rind. The guys on the, on the team like to call these new berries crunchy on the outside and soft in the middle. They, they make a lot of food analogies. I think they spend a lot of their time being hungry. And um, we still don't really know what they are. The crazy thing is that Curiosity has been seeing um, these little round things as well. Now, there are things that they could be besides concretions. They could also be something called impact lapilli, which are when you spray, a big impact happens, it, makes, it melts the rock, it sprays the rock into the air, and the little tiny droplets uh, immediately freeze into these little glass spherules. They've been found on the moon. A lot of the lunar regolith is made up of little glass spheres that are, that are impact spherules. And so I think they've fairly conclusively proven that the hematite ones at Opportunities Landing Site are concretions, which means that they formed inside the rocks by being wetted and there is dissolution of iron-rich material and then they re-coalesced um, into these little spherical things. But we, I don't think they've proven yet that this other stuff is not impact lapilli and there are, there are even, there's volcanic lapilli that you can have. And so there's a, there's a number of different ways you could get these spheres. Still, spheres, little tiny spheres in rocks all over Mars, it's not something you would find on Earth. And that's one thing that's, that I think has gotten a lot of the scientists kind of excited. It's just so weird and fun. It's a fun yeah. picture to look at. Yeah, I love those pictures. Uh, so let's do two questions here about Mars, then we'll move on because we have a whole solar system to talk about. <laughs> yes, um, we do. Uh, so Rob Kroll asks, uh, how old is this evidence for past water on Mars? Is it younger or uh, older than on the Earth that we start seeing water on Mars? I guess this is in reference mainly to the Curiosity site. Sure, but the story at the Curiosities site is actually similar to the story elsewhere on Mars. The, I've, I've been researching this question of water on Mars, when, where, how much, and one thing that I've learned recently that I didn't respect before is the fact that, that Mars appears to have been quite dry, very, very deep in its past, and then it got wet for a relatively brief geologic period. We're talking a couple hundred million years, which is it's it's not a short time geologically. It's a it's a goodly chunk of Mars history, but it but it's very it, it, you know it's a very limited time frame when water appears to have been mobile on the surface. It carved these things called valley networks. It may have may or may not have made a northern ocean. That's an area of huge debate in the Mars environment in the Mars community. Um, and it only lasted this very, very brief period around the end of the Noachian era and the beginning of what's called the Hesperian era. It seems to have been after the gigantic Tharsis volcanoes formed, um, and then the, there is some water activity for a couple hundred million years, and then it kind of waned to its present day level. Now, in the present day, the Mars that we see is incredibly arid, incredibly dry. But there is this other weird thing about Mars's climate where, you know, it has an axis that tilts just like ours does, that makes seasons. But Mars's axis tilts a great deal more at some times in its history, almost horizontal, almost so that the, the, the whole northern hemisphere is illuminated for like most of the, Mar for half the Martian year, and then it switches to the south like Uranus is. Um, and then sometimes it's quite vertical. And also, Mars has um, the second most elliptical orbit of the planets, the first being, being Mercury, which means that it spends some of its time farther and some of its time closer. And depending on the precession, the, it's the precession of the argument of perihelion um, that, that makes it so that sometimes the seasons line up in different positions at different distances on Mars's orbit. And what all of this does together is it makes Mars's climate vary by a huge amount. And so there could be a period every couple tens of thousands of years 
when you have the poles spending a lot of the a lot of the time in the year pointed directly at the sun and you could have these briefly wet periods where there are times where there's enough water in Mars's atmosphere that liquid water becomes briefly stable for brief periods on the surface so even today geologically speaking there could be some liquid water activity on the surface but it's nothing at all like earth um, but going back to the original question this period of time when Mars did have liquid water moving around was around 3.8, 3.6 billion years ago. It's a, you know, give or take 100 million years. It's roughly around the time that of the evidence for the oldest known life on Earth. So it, everything was kind of wet at the same time when life was getting its start. So it's, it's kind of an interesting coincidence. Um, of course, 100 million years is nothing to a geologist, but it's a lot to you or me. So I, I don't know how much of a coincidence it actually is, but it's, it's an interesting thing to think about. I love geologic time. It's like, oh, give or take half a billion years or something. <laughs> right. uh, so let me break real quick and remind you, uh, the viewer, that you are watching a production of the Planetary Society. We are a nonprofit, member-based organization with over 40,000 members across the world, a growing organization dedicated to promoting space exploration, to education, and to political advocacy for space, uh, mainly here in the United States. So. We are, uh, again, a nonprofit, that which means we depend on you, people like you, to support us, to keep us running. Uh, consider joining us as a member. You get a great uh, magazine, the latest issue, which is all about uh, Europa and what missions we could send there are just coming out. I have a great, if I may say so, article on there myself. Uh, you get that quarterly with subscription. Member, uh, that's at planetary.org slash join or planetary.org slash donate if you want to kick us a few bucks. So thank you for watching, and please help us keep enabling uh, science to happen, exploration to happen, and uh, education and excitement. Also, if you want to ask us a question, uh, tweet on uh, hashtag planetary live, or you can comment on our Google Plus Hangout uh, that you're watching right now, or on the YouTube page where this is being broadcast. We will try to get to as many as possible. Uh, so before we move on, I mean, let me jump back to one subject that had to do with LPSC, and uh, then we'll go back to the science, and that's travel restrictions. So the sequester is hitting NASA. We're really starting to see the effects of this across the board indiscriminate cut. And right before this big conference, NASA released this sudden new guideline heavily restricting travel from all of its employees to scientific conferences. They have a maximum of 50 NASA employees at any conference, which sounds like a lot, but then you have to remember there are tens of thousands of NASA scientists, and they represent a big chunk of the community. And restricting them down to 50 really takes away a lot of scientists' presence. from. And it uh, wasn't just NASA. I mean, <clears throat> this conference is also affected by the uh, United States Geologic Survey. A lot yes. of those guys didn't get to come either. So. Yes, yes, true. Yeah. And this isn't just NASA. There's a lot of scientific organizations that are limiting travel. Uh, and also, uh, just last week, we saw new restrictions on NASA's education and public outreach and this is something that kind of took a lot of people by surprise there was a leaked memo on NASA watch that said uh, by the way we're going to suspend all education public outreach activities um, that obviously caused quite a bit of a stir since a lot of people tend to like NASA telling people what they're doing uh, communicating to the public who pays the bill for NASA all the great stuff that NASA does and uh, at the same time, NASA has not been able to tell anybody how much money this actually will save. So it's a mess. Uh, we're trying to figure out what's going on. Emily, have you heard from any like, individuals saying how they're feeling this impact yet? No, it's really totally unclear. I've heard of people trying to figure things out, but nobody who really has, has any specifics about, you know, this thing has got canceled because of this directive. Yeah, so I, I've been trying to call NASA representatives. I've spoke to uh, one, Jason Townsend, who's the social media director at NASA, deputy director, um, and he emphasized, and this is something I should also emphasize, is that uh, all of NASA's existing websites and social media accounts seem to be exempted from the suspension. They will continue, as far as we know. They will continue. So that's great for if you interact with NASA online. However, the vagaries of the memos and the seeming contradictions and multiple other exemptions are causing a real chilling effect through a lot of programs because they don't know what they're supposed to be doing or not. So there's a lot of chaos going on at NASA headquarters right now. This is all due to the sequester, this, again, indiscriminate cuts applied to NASA and all of these other federal agencies. So it's starting to feel, really starting to feel this, and again, it's coming just at a really bad time for science because again this doesn't just affect things like travel 
and education, this is going to ultimately really be affecting how NASA can actually do science, how it can explore, how it can get out into space. So I just posted on our blog about it, what we know, um, which isn't much, but we're going to be following this closely too. So, you know, even though planetary science got a bump in its funding this year, the rest of NASA is really suffering. So we're, we're really having a good news, bad news situation. And again, the story is not over, so we'll be following this. Um, okay, let's talk about science again, because that's more mm -hmm. fun. Um, so let's move on. Let's move on to, uh, to Mercury. That You posted something, Emily, that I was kind of shocked to see the title of, which was, do we have a meteorite from Mercury? And first, tell me, you, you don't have to say yes or no, but first tell me why that would be so surprising. Well, um, the, it, as you know, Mercury is the closest planet to the Sun. The Sun has 99, more than 99% of the mass of everything in the solar system. It is very hard to launch something from Mercury and make it get to Earth. It just takes a huge amount of energy. Um, but some recent work, uh, actually not that recent, somebody gave me a reference, so there's a link to it in the, in the blog post now, I think it was like in 2008, they did some dynamical modeling and figured out that there should be approximately 23 times as many Martian meteorites on Earth as there are Mercury meteorites. And since there are more than 70 known Martian meteorites, you do the math, you figure there ought to be roughly three, give or take a couple, Mercury meteorites somewhere in our collections. And um, that's kind of surprising because we've thought for a long time that there shouldn't be any Mercury meteorites. It's impossible. You can't possibly launch it from that close to the sun. And yet they, they could be around. Now, it's axiomatic that if there is a question asked in the headline of an article, the answer is probably no. <laughs> and so in this particular case, the uh, speaker made a case. He, he thinks he has a strong case that this thing is a Mercury meteorite. It certainly is quite different from a lot of other meteorites. It certainly comes from something that was differentiated, meaning that it was molten, at some, or at least partially molten at some point, so that its denser stuff sank and lighter stuff, including a white mineral called plagioclase, rose toward the top of, of some at least large magma body. Um, and it has certain compositional things that, that are not uh, dissimilar from what we know now of Mercury from Messenger. Um, however, there are some problems. The, the biggest one, and actually one that I didn't, I forgot to mention in the blog post, is the fact that you perform uh, isotopic age dating on this thing, and it's 4.56 billion years old, which is incredibly ancient. None of the rocks that we have that are other meteorites from other planetary bodies have uh, crystallization ages that are this old. It's only, I forget now what the number is for the age of the solar system, but it's, it's somewhere, it's like 100 million years um, younger than the age of the solar system, which is, which is really very short period of time. So I think that the jury's still out on whether this particular meteorite that I have a picture of in the post is a Mercury one. But I, so I think that the most important lesson here is that somewhere there's got to be a Mercury meteorite. There's got to be at least one by now and, and maybe even a couple more. And if we keep searching and finding more of these rare meteorites in, in locations around the Earth deserts, like uh, this one was found in Northwest Africa and Morocco, um, we one of these days we will find a Mercury meteorite, and so I think that's pretty cool. Do we have to depend on Messenger to get a good idea of what a Mercury rock should look like, or can we do this independent of, of Messenger? Well, um, you, we we do kind of need Messenger because we need to know what what kind of elemental abundances we're talking about. Um, it, it, you know, we need these kind of fingerprints that let us know whether this rock is a good match or not a good match spectrally for the kinds of material that are exposed at the surface of Mercury. Because remember, meteorites that we get from planets, come, they have to come from the surface. Um, they, can't, they can't come from the deep interior. You, you get them by blasting the surface with a, with a large asteroid and by spalling off a rock. So it's got to be shocked. It's got to be accelerated to faster than escape velocity without being heated so much that it melts and becomes something completely unrecognizable. And so these things do come from very close to the surface. The stuff at the surface is what gets accelerated to those really high velocities that they can possibly escape. And um, it's really kind of amazing that you can do this without actually raising the temperature very much. In fact, you can, you can do it by, and keep the interior so cool that if there were any microbes inside an earth rock that you blasted off of earth, they could still be very happily living inside an Earth meteorite that was floating around the solar system for hundreds of millions of years. There have actually been studies where they took little impact uh, spherules and, uh, or little 
experiments where they put microbes or spores inside little things that they accelerated in guns to like one, two kilometers per second and smacked them into something. And some of these spore materials actually survived. It's uh, not something that you would want to happen to you, but to a microbial um, life form that has an, a rather inactive spore form that can survive extreme environments, hey, you know, it could take a ride on a meteorite for a long time and, and wind up landing somewhere else. You know, someone should really try a test of putting some um, uh, microbes out into space and sending it out in space for a someone while. Not to. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, uh, sorry, that's Planetary Society's life experiment, which was on the ill-fated uh, Russian Phobos Grunt we'll spacecraft. We'll do it again sometime. <laughs> Currently exploring the depths of the uh, Atlantic Ocean, I believe, <laughs> um, or the Baltic Ocean. So uh, let's move on beyond. So. Mercury, and let's jump out a few, uh, couple billion Actually, kilometers. Actually, I, oh, I want to keep on Mercury. There's something that I haven't written a blog post about before um, yet. I'm, I'm waiting to get some material from my friend Louise Proctor, who is the, I think now she's the deputy project, she's certainly the head of the um, camera team on the messenger mission. And they are trying to get their a second mission extension. Their first extended mission at Mercury, which was one Earth year long, ended on March 17th. And they have done some amazing things on Mercury. They've really revolutionized our view of that little world that I think before Messenger got there, people thought of it as just a dried up crispy moon. It looks like the moon, it's got a bunch of craters and it looks pretty dead and nobody cares. But since Messenger got there, we've seen how the variety of landforms it has, how different it is geologically. It's got these wacky things called hollows that may be places where um, Igneous rock is actually evaporating, you know, sublimating into the atmosphere. It's just bizarre stuff. And so there's a lot to be done there. And so Louise presented on what they could do with a two-year mission extension. They have enough fuel. They've, they've been carefully preserving their fuel because it's very hard to stay in orbit at Mercury with the sun doing all kinds of nasty things to your orbit. Um, and one of the cool things that they can do with their mission is that they have uh, experiments that, that study Mercury's exosphere, which is this uh, just very tenuous atmosphere of ions that have been sputtered off the Mercury surface. And the way that, that Mercury gets this exosphere is because of the solar wind blasting into Mercury's surface and, and sputtering all this stuff off. Well, we've been in solar minimum for a long time. And not only that, but Mariner visited it during solar minimum. And the next Mercury mission, Bepi Colombo, is going to be getting there during solar minimum. We're, we're, um, we're just about to solar maximum. Messenger has been on, the, um, has been on sort of the upswing, uh, getting into solar maximum. If they extend the mission for two more years, it'll, it'll be at Mercury through solar maximum when there is the most possible energetic stuff flying around, sputtering stuff off of Mercury's surface, doing all kinds of fun things to its magnetic field, and giving more and more material for the spacecraft to sample. Not only that, but there's a couple of really cool comets that are going to be swinging by the sun this year, in the next couple of years, and so and and Messenger is really uniquely situated to be studying those things. There's no other spacecraft in a position so close to the sun that can look from the sun outward to see these things. So there's a lot of really super cool science that they could do if NASA ever gets around to saying, yes, you can have a second mission extension, which is kind of weird because it's already 11 days past the end of what it's uh, it's already been budgeted to do. And normally that would be a no-brainer, and that would be easy because mission extensions are on the order of a few million dollars a year, which for, you know, compared to building and launching a mission is very cheap. However, this is again one of those things where policy is important. This is the effects of the sequester and also the effects of the continued lack of commitment to planetary science within NASA and within the administration. Yeah, so I think this, this, is, is, this is a budget one more than a sequester one. Yeah, just in general, the budget was so tight and now it's tighter, as the uh, as tends to be the, the problem. So we are uh, we'll keep following that. And again, it's one of those things where it should just logically it's no brainer, but government rarely works with logic. So uh, is that more Mercury stuff, Emily, or is <laughs> yeah, that, that's that's that's, good. that's all I got on Mercury. So Mercury's hopefully right we'll get lots more LPSC conferences with Messenger data. Um, when does Bepi Colombo get there? Uh, Twenty. 15, 16? It's a while. So, I don't know off the top of my head. So the Bepi Years. Colombo is the European uh, mission to, to Mercury. So. European and uh, Japanese. Jap oh, yes, right. Excuse me. Uh, let's talk about uh, icy moons. Um, you had a, a great post just the other day talking about something that surprised me, and maybe I should have known this, but I didn't, 
you talked about Ganymede, which is a, the biggest moon in the solar system, the one around uh, Jupiter, and that, like Europa, it also may have uh, an ocean underneath it, a very different kind of ocean, but water nonetheless. Is that correct? That's right. I, I kind of I tend to feel sort of sorry for Ganymede. It's huge. It's the biggest moon in the solar system. It looks like a planet. It's got all. It's got what look like continents and oceans, even though they're not oceans. They're just a different kind of surface material. It's got an internal ocean. It's got a. It's got its own internal magnetic field. It, it may have a liquid core. Um, it's. It's just. It's a really really cool planet. And yet it's constantly being shown up by Io with all of its sexy volcanoes and Europa with its uh, possibly very close to the surface liquid ocean. And so people never give Ganymede enough respect. Fortunately, the Europeans are planning and preparing to launch a mission that is currently um, non-nicely uh, named JUICE. Uh, hopefully they will come up with a better name for it. Um, and eventually it will go into orbit around Ganymede and will finally give Ganymede the respect that it deserves. Um, in 20, uh, 2032 or something That's yeah, a like long that. time yeah. from now. So there are a lot of snide comments being made about how many decades it's going to be before we get back to Jupiter with a spacecraft that's actually studying the moons. Um, but anyway, so Ganymede does have an ocean just like Europa. So you might be wondering, why don't people seem to care as much about Ganymede's ocean as they do about Europa's ocean? And the main difference between the two is that Europa is much smaller than Ganymede. It's also slightly denser. And both of those things combined make it quite likely that underneath Europa's icy crust, then you have an ocean, and that ocean very likely goes all the way down to the rocky core. It's liquid all the way down. And what that means is that you've got a geologically active rocky core that's, that's warm and liquid water that's in contact with that. So you've got energy, you've got liquid water as a, as a solvent, and you've got the rock, which contains all of the interesting chemistry, all the interesting different elements, trace elements and common elements. And so it's, it, it makes a soup that makes it a, a very attractive place to think about trying to originate and support life. Ganymede, on the other hand, is so much bigger that um, probably it has its ocean is sandwiched between an icy layer on top made of the kind of ice that we're familiar with, which is called ice one, and a different high pressure form of ice below it, probably ice six, maybe a layer of ice five and ice six. Um, but the talk that I saw that was kind of cool was talking about how under certain specific kinds of conditions, if you have the right temperature at the bottom of Ganymede's icy layer, you could actually have what he called a Dagwood sandwich, where you have ice one, then you've got water, then you've got ice three, then you've got water, then you've got ice five and ice six. And through all of this, there could be stuff snowing and moving around and liquids with salt, and it's all in a magnesium sulfate brine with other stuff that's dissolved in it. And so Ganymede could be very dynamic and interesting um, geologically and chemically too. And so he said, you know, don't don't disrespect Ganymede. There there are prospects for life there as much as there are at Europa. One of the last slides that he had in his talk though made me really think because it showed the um, sort of a habitable zone from a different point of view from what we usually think about in terms of where water can exist. So we know water exists inside these worlds as it does on Earth and as it has in the past on Mars. But if you look at the temperature versus the pressure of that water, Earth has water existing at very low pressures. Um, Mars, when it was uh, presumably wet, also had water existing at very low pressures. Enceladus has salt water existing at very low pressures. Enceladus is a very small moon of Saturn that's got these geysers coming out from a presumed subsurface ocean. It's a tiny moon, not much gravity, so the pressure there is very low. Europa is way higher pressure than any of these things are, and Ganymede is like eight times higher pressure than Europa. So we don't, we haven't really talked about trying to do organic chemistry at these intensely high pressures. And uh, then there needs to be some experiments done to see are these same kind of chemical reactions viable or do you just compress everything into some kind of crystalline form that doesn't have these, you know, long wavy carbon chains that can make proteins and interact with each other. So I think it's a, it was an interesting um, thought provoking question, one that's worth investigating. Emily, I like your life molecule hands. I think that, mm -hmm. <laughs> Jazz <laughs> hands. <laughs> that's the level of technology we have for these hangouts. So, that's right. So, uh, so let me get to some questions. We have some questions coming in. Uh, let me start with some of the icy moon stuff, and then we'll kind of step back and, uh, and address some of the stuff about Mars from earlier that we weren't able to get to if we have time. Uh, so let's uh, Bill Campbell asks, is it possible to have thermal vents 
um, on either Ganymede or Europa? And I think the answer is yes, at least on Europa. I'm not so sure about Ganymede. It, um, I think I think for both it's true. So the the deal is that um, in in both of those worlds, and indeed also in the the icy moons of Saturn. The geologic energy that you have that's making um, the surfaces look relatively youthful, it doesn't come from the same source as Earth's energy comes from. Earth still has primordial heat left over from its formation and from the, the decay of radioactive elements. Um, all of these other worlds also had primordial heat, both from their formation and from radioactive element decay, but because they're so much smaller, most of that heat, that original heat, has radiated away. So in the absence of their orbits around these giant planets, they would be cold, dead ice balls like, say, Minus is right today. Um, but because there are many of these moons in orbit around giant planets, and they have orbital resonances, and in particular at Jupiter, you have Io goes around four times for every two times Europa goes around for every one time Ganymede goes around. So they're in this um, complicated orbital resonance that pushes and pulls and squeezes and massages the shapes of these worlds. And that creates an incredible amount of friction inside the worlds, that change in shape. When you think about squeezing something the size of a planet um, every couple of days as it orbits Jupiter, that is a tremendous amount of heat energy that is being uh, punched into these planets. Io shows that by being the most volcanically active world in the whole solar system. Um, Europa shows that by having a pretty youthful looking surface, even though it's frozen as ice on the surface. We know it's got to be re relatively active inside. There's got to be something going on with all that heat. Ganymede is a little less active than Europa, but still it has parts of its surface that, um, you know, have, have very youthful ages in, ter in geologic terms, tens, hundreds of millions of years old. And so um, with all of that heat energy, you know that at, at a very fine scale, that heat energy has to be coming out in little vents of various kinds. Who knows, there might be black smoking vents on the bottom of Europa's ocean the way there are at very deep levels in, in our own ocean. We of course haven't seen them, so and we were incredibly surprised by all of the wonderful things we saw when we first did deep Earth ocean exploration. And so if we ever get a, a sub submersible of some kind into Europa, we're going to have to solve this problem of how intense the pressure is down there. Um, who knows what we're going to find at the bottom of that ocean. It'll be pretty interesting. I guess the, the trick is just we just have to go and look. <laughs> uh, um, uh, we have a, someone here. It's not quite a question, but they're just chanting series, series, series <laughs> over again. Uh, that's Pete Coons on uh, YouTube. Yeah. And uh, do we, was there any information on series? But uh, if there won't, there will be here in a few years, right? Yeah. Uh, yes and no. So, so here is one of my one of the most annoying things that happened at this conference. There was a session on Vesta. There, I think there are actually two sessions on Vesta. But somebody on the Dawn mission team posted a little sign on the door that said, "No microblogging or tweeting allowed from this session." And uh, some friends of mine tried to figure out who it was who did this. And I do know that the um, project scientists, the deputy project scientist, anyway, Carol Raymond said it wasn't her, you know, it wasn't them. So somebody acting on their own said nobody should be talking about Vesta. And, and I took one look at that and I was like, you know, screw you guys, I'm going home. I'm going to go to Mars or to um, Titan or someplace else where people actually want me to talk about what you guys are doing. So I have no idea what they were presenting on, on Vesta. It's kind of a sad thing. This whole mission has been, uh, they haven't really done a great job of engaging the public. They have fantastic data. Um, Vesta looks really cool, and I, and I still can't wait to see Ceres. It's, um, it's a round world. In, it's the only round world in the asteroid belt. There's um, probably water, at least in its minerals, on its surface. And who knows, there could even be a little ice here and there below the surface. We won't know until we get there. Um, and I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it. I just hope that they do... By the time we get there, that they've got their act together a little bit better on engaging the public with their images and their science than they currently do um, after their mission to Vesta. Well, they just need a better uh, education public outreach budget. <laughs> ah, damn. All right. Yeah, uh, I don't think that's the problem. <laughs> the, uh, but just to remind everyone, this is the NASA's Dawn mission uh, that we're talking about, which has this cool little ion engine that is able to even though it pushes very slowly, can have a lot of energy over time. And so it's going from Vesta out to Ceres. What was it, 2015, I think? 2015. It's, 2015. It's, 2015 is going to be a banner year because we're going to have 
Um, Juno's approaching Jupiter. We've got um, New Horizons passing by Pluto. There's all kinds of exciting stuff happening in 2015, so it'll be thrilling. So the, we'll, we'll talk more then about series. One, one of the reasons that Dawn is weird is actually something, and this gets back to the budget, it's, it's something that's been happening on Discovery missions recently, where the way that they get to be cheap, because Discovery is the least expensive NASA mission line, is that NASA builds the spacecraft, but then... Um, other countries, typically European countries, contribute the instruments, and NASA doesn't pay for those because NASA won't pay a European government for an instrument. The European governments have to put up the money. So, um, and I think that's true. Is that true of Insight as well? Yeah, almost all the instruments on Insight are from European uh, Europe. And so it, it's kind of a weird thing where we wind up building the bus and somebody else gets the credit for the science. And I don't think I like that very much. Um, as I like the fact that space exploration is highly international. Um, but I don't like the fact that American scientists are getting priced out of building instruments on discovery missions because of the way that the discovery budgets work. I, I don't think that that's good for science. I don't think it's good for for everybody. So um, I don't know. I don't have a suggested way to, to solve that problem, but I, I think it is a, a problem with a discovery program. Well, the uh, decadal survey from uh, 2011 did recommend increasing the budget for discovery program for for discovery missions up to 500 million, which might help with that a little bit. Um, though honestly, that might get eaten up by cost of rockets these days. Yeah. But uh, just a shameless plug: if anyone wants to join as a member of the Planetary Society, there just happens to be an article <laughs> in the latest Planetary Report talking all about discovery missions, what they are, how they work, and what we lose when they have to compete against each other. So, uh, planetary.org/join. Um, Let's see, more questions here. Let's say, um, let's go back to Mars real quick. And there is a question here saying, does the comet A2013 heading to Mars, will that have an impact on politicians or NASA budget uh, for Mars? And I will answer that one very succinctly and say no, uh, probably because politicians, they may like general things, but it really helps to have concrete things. So maybe if there was a mission or something, maybe we could try to advocate for that. But they're not just going to throw money at NASA just because something cool is happening at Mars, unfortunately. If that happened, uh, we'd be great, because cool things happen in space all the time, and if Congress just threw money at NASA, we'd be doing uh, pretty well. So unfortunately, the answer is no to that one. Now, by contrast, though, um, though, we have seen some evidence for Congress. If they, Maybe they're not throwing money at NASA yet, but they're certainly calling for meetings about the Russian meteor. And so when you have something that passes close by Earth and makes people think, you know, it's a shot across the bow, could that happen to us, um, then that, that kind of event does get a politician's attention and has right. gotten politician's attention. Yeah, and that one's a little different because of our own self-interest, um, honestly, which is a good thing. I think they should consider our, our self-well-being and not being destroyed uh, by an asteroid. So that's in a situation like that, yes, that's a good point. There's another uh, question here from um, Mr. <laughs> for cups. Are these rock berries, so those little weird uh, new berries that we saw, mm -hmm. are they similar to oolites found on Earth, which are usually much smaller? Um, similar, some of them are, yes. So oolites are found in limestone in, um, in carbonate-rich environments. They're uh, places where you have some kind of little tiny grain. You have them, they typically form in um, places like near atolls. So places where you have uh, uh, coral as a source of this limestone, this carbonate material. You get a little tiny seed. It's a lot like a pearl. It sort of washes gently back and forth in the ocean uh, right on the shore, and it forms little concentric shells of limestone making a little sphere. And, and when you slice them open, then you can see the little concentric rings. You can find rocks, limestone rocks, that are made of, of their oolitic limestones. And when they break, you can see right through, you can see the little concentric um, spheres. I think these things are... Um, they're similar in appearance, but they did not form those the same way. I don't think I've ever heard anybody arguing that any of these spherical things formed by gentle washing back and forth at the shore of a lake. I think that there's not a lot of evidence, actually, for um, these kinds of uh, um, lake or ocean shore-type rocks yet. We've seen lots of evidence at the Curiosity Landing Site for river-type deposits, and the stuff that it's sitting on right now could be at the bottom of very still water, but we don't have, um, I think, any strong evidence for shore-type environment yet. Uh, so here's a good kind of a rhetorical question. 
which is uh, Chibi asks if the only option, if we only had one mission to Europa, which actually is very probably likely, um, what would you prioritize? What kind of experiments and tools would you put on it? Uh, do you want to start? Do you have anything that you'd love to see in a Europa mission, Emily? Well, we we really, you know, there's a lot of the basics that haven't been done for Europa yet. We don't have a good um, quality, high resolution global map of the world yet. There's the the North Pole is almost completely not covered by imaging. Um, a lot of the talks that you see on Europa when they're mapping out various landforms, you know, the rings around craters, they they're sliced off because we don't have image of the north half of that crater. And so you you just you need basic. We basically need a messenger type mission. Um, you need to do global mapping, multi-spectral mapping, so that you can get at the compositions of the whole surface. Um, you need to have a laser altimeter or some other means of getting high resolution topography. You can do that either with laser altimetry or with um, stereo imaging, but it really helps to have laser altimetry to tie everything together. Um, you need gravity data, so you need to have orbits where you're just spending your time staring at Earth with your radio and just uh, seeing how your orbit changes as a result of um, the changing density of stuff in the subsurface. You need um, to study its exosphere. So I, I mean, I, I think I'm basically advocating you sending something like Messenger. Obviously, it would have to be a very different mission at that in that part of the solar system. But you want something like that at Europa. Now, the mission that's been described in the planetary report is not quite this thing because the problem of sending Messenger to uh, Europa, it's actually, it's its hard in the same way that sending Messenger to Mercury was in the first place. We didn't send a mission to Mercury for a really long time because it is dang hard to get into orbit around such a tiny thing next to such a great big thing. And so uh, you could do that at Europa for the flagship type budget of around $2 billion, give or take a billion. Um, but if you want to spend less money, then you have to stay in orbit around Jupiter instead. It's just energetically so difficult to get into orbit around Europa that it, it, you just give up and you go into orbit around Jupiter instead, which is the kind of mission that we actually have at Saturn right now. So that's what Cassini is doing. Cassini is orbiting Saturn and mapping all of the moons of Saturn on flybys of the moons. And so um, the Europa Clipper is the current proposed mission for Europa. will be um, will be able to map Europa at pretty good resolution by doing numerous flybys of that moon. Of course, the other thing that makes Jupiter difficult is that it has this mass massive magnetic field that just wrecks havoc on electronics. So you end up having to put a lot of weight, and, and weight is money in spacecraft. You have to put a lot of weight just into shielding your electronics and sending bulkier electronics that are more stable in this high ra um, intense radiation environment than the more miniaturized stuff that you can get away with that's in Earth orbit. In Earth orbit now, you can power a, a you know a CubeSat with an iPhone, and and you can do that for a few tens of thousands of dollars if you're you know at the sixth payload on an Indian launch. You you don't have to spend a whole lot of money building a teeny tiny spacecraft at Earth, but it's just the difficult environment, just getting it there and making it not get killed by the magnetic field and the energetic particle environment at Jupiter eats up almost all of your money before you've even started putting any instruments on the spacecraft. That's true. And uh, again, if anyone wants to learn more about the Europa Clipper mission, we do have a whole article in the Planetary Report. Uh, I swear these were not I think they've gotten the questions. point, Casey. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. It's very interesting. Um, and I would just add one thing. If, if this is the money where no object kind of thing, I would totally put a European submarine to like melt through with a little See? thermonuclear reactor and like melt through. You know through. what? I wouldn't. No? You I wouldn't, wouldn't want to kill anything down there? Well, no. Um, it's not that I don't want to kill stuff that's there. It's that I don't want to bring Earth life with me and contaminate the European environment with Earth life before we have settled the question of whether there's anything there in the first place. And furthermore, I don't think, I, I just don't think it's responsible to land on an object before you have mapped it in enough detail to know what kind of lander you need. Um, and so I think that it's, you could send, I could see sending like a penetrometer or something to Europa. Um, something that wasn't designed for a soft land, you just bang, slam it into the ice and, and you know, you have some kind of geophysical information you can get from that, temperature information, heat flow, you could get a lot of really useful information from that. But um, I just think, you know, we're, we're very impatient, we humans, because our life our lifespans are so short. But I just don't think that it's time yet to send a submersible to Europa as much as Jim Cameron would like to do so. 
<laughs> yeah, I guess uh, if you, like me, subscribe to the fact that I think we should seed our DNA of Earth <laughs> all over the solar system and the other life be damned, then uh, it's a great, great idea. So, okay, well, on that note, I think we, <laughs> there's, uh, we there's, should... I do, see, I do see one more question that I, that I want to okay, answer. Yeah, Going sure. way back to Mars, um, Per Wilner asks if there's much water ice in the ground. Um, and as a matter of fact, there's a ton of water ice available on Mars. Just It's there for the digging. And not only is there ice in the ground, but it's not like ice that's all gunked up inside pore space, inside dirt. There are lenses of 99% pure ice located just inches below the surface across a huge swath of Mars. There is a ton of water there. Um, and all, all you'd have to bring is a shovel to get to the ice. It's very, very close to the surface. Um, the most heartbreaking thing uh, about how close the ice is to the surface is that Viking Lander 2, if it had just dug, in all likelihood, it, if, if it had taken that scoop and dug another 10 centimeters deeper, it would have reached this ultra-pure water ice found in Mars' northern lowlands, and perhaps the history of Mars' exploration might have been slightly different. Um, there's a ton of water on Mars. An interesting corollary a question to that is, is there liquid water below it? Because on Earth, where you have permafrost, you have ice in the subsurface, at some depth below that, you, because of the geothermal gradient, Earth's inside is warm, it melts, and you get liquid water located below the surface. I actually just asked somebody this question, and he said, unfortunately, no. Most likely, there is not liquid water uh, below this, this ice table, because Mars's geothermal gra gradient is just much, much, much shallower than Earth's. It's just very cold for a very long way down. So too bad about that. But there is a, just a ton of ice um, very close to Mars's surface. And, uh, you know, it wouldn't take a whole lot to mobilize that ice. Read um, Kim Stanley Robinson's books on, on red Mars and green Mars and blue Mars to see really a not completely unrealistic view of, of how, how that mi ice could get mobilized. And, uh, and Mars Direct, or the case for Mars, for that matter, too. That the, is true. Uh, using. Um, and uh, also just to note that InSight will tell us a lot more about the geothermal gradient of Mars yes. once it lands in uh, 2016. It's going to put a big uh, probe down, what, five meters or so into the Martian soil, which is pretty astounding, actually. Mm -hmm. um, and the last thing, this is a real question, I just will say quickly. They said, is the Planetary Society newsletter also sent outside to the U.S., like in Germany? Yes, it just happens to be. Yes, yeah, so to sign up as an international member, you will get that internationally. So that's the last plug today, I swear, <laughs> except to tell you to watch next week. Uh, same time, same place, uh, uh, same one of us will be hosting. Uh, we will be noon on Thursday, so it's every week. Join us again for the Planetary Society Hangout. Once again, you have watched a production of the Planetary Society, the world's largest nonprofit space-based, or space-based, uh, pro-space exploration. We wish. Yeah, <laughs> future space based, um, uh, membership based uh, nonprofit organization promoting advo uh, uh, advocation, <laughs> education, and uh, creation of our own projects and uh, research opportunities. So thank you for watching, Emily. Thank you for joining us, and thank you for going out to Houston to cover LPSC. I'm no you had a great time, <laughs> I did. and uh, we will check in with you again. Thanks for watching. 